good evening. Uh, my name is Richard Miller. You're never not here, and uh, maybe you've never seen me this way. I just thought, let's just be casual. Let's just be, let's just be laid back. And uh, I actually don't want to talk too much in the beginning. Uh, I do and I don't, but I just want to say we're with Vishrant today. Uh, it's good evening and it's good morning to him. He's in Perth, Australia. And uh, so let's welcome him. Welcome him. Hi, Vishant. Vishrant. Oh, hi there, Richard. I've talked to a lot of people and uh, recorded it, so I get to see it again and again, Not, uh, at least several times while I edit and so on. And it becomes pretty clear that each of us has our own take on life, uh, at least for me. and. Not that much can really be absorbed just by listening and talking. I often make out like it, a lot can be discovered with dialogue. But also, a lot remains the same. And uh, I often wonder, what can we really tell each other? What can we really say to each other? How can we really connect? And what is the the depth or the lack of depth of that connection. And I would like to experiment with that tonight and just see, like, what is the depth? whatever that might mean for each person listening or for you getting what I'm saying or for me what I'm trying to convey. Something we could call running seems to pervade a lot of human experience. And running is just speeding through life or just speeding by life, not really more, more missing it than really speeding through it. And for me, uh, it takes really a lot and a long time to, to get that.
it sort of has to do with allowing nothing to happen or the perception that nothing is getting done or I have nowhere to go, I have nothing to do. But uh, maybe you're a pretty good testimony that that's not universal. (laughs) Willingness to be, be simple. People are curious, I'm curious, what's natural? Is that a question? (laughs) What's natural? Or is it a statement? (laughs) I'm not sure. Let's have it a question then. What's natural? It's probably natural for the ego to keep moving because it's survival mechanism after all. It's not our true nature to keep moving. Beingness is silent and still and the moving one appears in it. It comes, it goes, it stays a while, then goes. And it can rest in beingness. It can become quiet. But I don't think it's it's truly its natural nature to be quiet. So, uh, so movement or agitation is normal. And we kind of get an idea what normal is just from... 10, 20, 30 years that we've been alive or more. But natural, maybe we need some coaching. (laughs) Natural. Uh, Everything's good. Everything's good. It's like there's this beautiful background that everything appears in. And if we look for that, we'll find the silence, we'll find the stillness, we'll find the peace. 
if we look in the mind, we're just going to find noise, really, because that's what it does. It makes noise. <laughs> but it's just, the noise is just dream appearing like a cloud in a beautiful blue sky. And most people miss the beautiful blue sky and concentrate on the cloud. And so they think that that's all that exists, this beautiful sky is missed because the cloud is constantly being looked at. There's nothing wrong with cloud. There's nothing wrong with the mind. It's just there's another way. You can start looking at the background that it all appears in. And if you keep looking at that, there comes a point where you discover you are that. And that this cloud that you thought you were is just a dream. So it, is it kind of always the case that we're, our attention goes on one thing at a time, either or? No, not at all. Awareness, that that's aware, pure awareness, can be aware of the mind, and the mind can be aware of the world through its senses, and it can also be aware of itself. So it can be facing in more than one direction, not just outwards towards the world through the senses and to the mind, but inwards onto itself as well. But in most people, awareness tends to be focused on the mind and through the mind, the senses, and the world. And so they miss the beauty of who they truly are because they're looking at the mind and thinking somehow that's who they are. They're looking at their body and thinking somehow that's who they are. When really the mind and the body are appearing in who they really are. This beautiful, beautiful sky. That's always here. Mind comes and goes. The body changes every seven years, apparently, every cell in it. But the sky is always here. So some explain it, you know, that uh, the sky is playing a game. If they can find who's playing the game, I'd like to be introduced. <laughs> Someone might be pulling the strings. I don't know. I've never met them. <laughs> so much of what we know is made of clouds. You know, our, our families. Yeah. Reference points. Our communities, that, yes. Re reference points that give us a sense of identity. But they're only reference points. They're not really who we are. And uh, as those reference points drop away, uh, it's easier to find the sky because we're not so solidly identified. So the future is a reference point, to have a future, to have plans for the future, to think you're going to somewhere, to think you're going to survive, that's a reference point that gives an identity. The same as the past, having a memory of the past, a family, friends, a job, this is all reference points that make up the identity that thinks it's real, the I. But they're not, it's not, they're just dream. As a matter of fact, if you take away your imagination, because well, the future is imagined and the past is imagined, what's here now? Without a, without a reference point, what's here now? Who are you? If you're not that, if you're not that dream, who are you? Really? Potential. <laughs> <laughs> potential to really? pl play with the cloud. <laughs> potential to play with the clouds. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> This, I like the way uh, Papaji put it. He, he he called it emptiness dancing. And I think that's, I mean, to to try and put it in the words, that's about as best as you get. I think just emptiness dancing. Terrifically poetic, but mm, then, terrifically. <laughs> yeah, but that dancing then is the playing, right? I mean, the play, the leela. God's play, the leela. And some people tend to create that leela as suffering by resisting constantly and other people don't. 
So the play is not necessary. Uh, or that emptiness can just be emptiness and doesn't need to dance or does it dance by choice? Any, or, yeah. I don't know. It's like I look at, you know, we get ants, ant nests around the, around the house and I look at the ants and I watch them moving around and building their, their little nests and protecting it and dragging food in and dragging dead bodies out and doing all sorts of things. And I look at them and I go, well, what's the purpose, you know? What's the purpose of that? You know, I don't know. It, they're building a nest. They're living. But purpose, I don't know. People love to have purpose. The, the mind likes to have a purpose, a reason, a meaning of life. And I've been looking for a meaning of life for, I don't know, 40 years, 42 years. I haven't found one yet. I had a lot of suggestions, a lot of ideas, purpose, meaning. I mean, I love what Eckhart Tolle said, that, that even the sun is going to die. What's the purpose then? It all goes. You know, this our sun do. What's the purpose? <laughs> I can't find it. I think he's looking. He's looking long, long term in the future. There. <laughs> yeah, that's but, a, kind know, of like a theory on the basis of the window that uh, humanity looks through. But uh, uh, couldn't you conjecture if there was uh, no purpose, then there would only be me, or only be one of us? But and, there is uh, only. There is only one of us. <laughs> but there is only one of us, Richard. So that's the purpose to discover that, right? <laughs> there you go. Purpose comes to it. I don't think so. I don't think beingness cares whether you discover it or not. I don't well, think heart that's, cares if that's you It's the discover. opportunity, right? To discover it is an opportunity. Well, there is that. Yeah, there is that. But I don't think there's any care. A lot of, a lot of the New Age talk is... You know, there's this purpose that beingness wants to discover itself and experience itself, but I think that's just a belief system. Well, I mean, when people say purpose, uh, that's a human condition, trying to place it on something that seems to also pervade the birds. <laughs> well, if we have no purpose and there is no meaning, why do we keep suffering? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I agree that suffering can only happen with a preconception. That it has to be a certain way, or it should go toward this way, or it should be like this, which conjectures up, uh, conjures up a purpose. Well, it conjures up re resistance in a way, because if we want it to go this way and it's not going that way, th if we go into resistance to that, that's what rises resistance, then we suffer. It's our resistance to what is that creates a suffering. If we're okay with what is, there's no, there's no suffering really. It's our yeah, resistance. No, I agree. I, I just think that uh, uh, even before resistance is the preconception that says, uh, you know, I'm like if you're a golfer, you say, I'm going to shoot toward the hole. If the ball goes sideways, <laughs> you say, oops, my preconception didn't get fulfilled. Could be. <laughs> mm. For a long time, uh, I, I realized that to be open is the most beautiful thing that we can do as human beings. And that the more open we can be, when that's the mind that's open, the more surrendered we are, the more lovely life is. And the more closed we are, the more separate we feel, the more we're in resistance to life and the more we suffer. So quite a long time ago, I reckon that if someone asked me in, in just one sentence what my teaching would be, if there's such a thing as a teaching, it would be that openness counts for everything. That's it. Openness counts for everything. Somewhere in that openness is, is compassion, or a compassion can arise. Maybe. And then, <laughs> yeah. And if, and if there's such a thing as compassion, then that's somehow uh, an empathy with somebody that's not quite that open. Right? Sure. Otherwise, why would they need, and they wouldn't, 
evoke any kind of compassion because uh, if they were totally open and I was too, then we would just be both dancing with whatever is. And we don't dance with whatever is? <laughs> it's a kind of a dance. It might be. I'm, I'm dancing with you right now. This is a beautiful dance. Do you know? We're dancing. It's a little bit slow, but I like a slow dance sometimes. Right. I mean, uh, it's a little bit slow. I don't say, I don't feel it's slow for me, although it's not normal. You know, it's exceptional. It's lovely, dude. <laughs> Maybe that is the dance, is compassion, because I think Papaji was a compassionate man. I think when the heart opens, the heart awakens, it affects the mind in a way that compassion is there. So you can care about someone from the mind, you can be kind, you can be generous, but I think compassion is when the heart hits the mind. And in compassion, there is so much beauty. In compassion, you lay down your life for another. The heart awakening is just the best. And I think when I look at Papaji and read Papaji, because I never met him, but he looks like a man whose heart was wide open. So seeing that, it evokes a desire to give it a try or to also be. I guess we don't know what wide open is. It's we an just, absence of it's an absence of you, Rigid. Yeah. Wide open is an absence of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the, the mind, the, the identified mind, the ego is resistance itself. It's resistance. I see that. <laughs> I see that. I was saying we don't know what wide open is, is because we don't know what wide is. You know, maybe we're <laughs> apparently an absence of me, and then I don't know. If a, yeah. This is narrow, <laughs> and this is wider. And wider. Wide. We know what wider is. <laughs> we know what wider is. <laughs> but we don't know what wide, if there is such a thing, is. Wide. <laughs> right on. So uh, opening the heart is not something that really it's a you can do if opening the heart is an absence of you. Yeah. It seems to relate to surrender in some way. But it's a bit of a mystery to me. The heart is a bit of a mystery to me. It is so beautiful. It is so lovely. But, Jesus, what I know about I don't know. How do you find the heart? How do you how do you really find the heart? Maybe a question is how do you how did you lose it? If well, maybe maybe you didn't you hadn't found it in the first place. That's, for me, I didn't feel like I I experienced the beauty of true unconditional love until I was in my thirties. Up until then, I cared about people, and I said I loved them, and I had needs for them, and I had wants of them, and um, I had expectations of them, and and people told me they loved me, and I told them I loved them, and that seemed like love to me. And then, when I was 33, 
unconditional love appeared inside of me and and I'd never experienced anything that beautiful. You'd die for that. So I, maybe that's what I was referring to because, uh, you know, at age 30, maybe you thought you cared for people you loved, for people you were wide open. And then the real true meaning of wide hit like a thunder. Yeah. The, the realization that openness counts for everything is a pretty big one because we go through life um, resisting this, resisting that, putting up an argument, getting righteous and standing by that righteousness with force. And in a way, we create our own hell instead of our own heaven. Because what's here is beautiful, but as soon as we bring in this resistance, we go to hell. We go to contraction. And we live as that and we justify it because we're right and something else is wrong or whatever instead of just letting go and being. So in the, uh, in the beginning, it was like learning to just get out of the way completely and then still be in the world in a way where boundaries were put up. That was the trick because what we usually do when we put boundaries up, we close inside to do it. So if I'm arguing with you, I'll put my boundary up in the argument, but also I'll close inside. Now for me, the trick was learning to put that boundary for you because you may need a boundary, but at the same time to remain absolutely wide open inside. And in that openness, I can hold you in my heart. In closeness, I can't. So when we confront someone, usually there's this automatic closing inside to somehow protect us from whatever's going to come back. And I think that's natural. I think that's a natural thing. It's a natural defense system. And for me, it was uh, the practice of if someone does that, if something happens where I find myself in resistance or in contraction, there was a, an opening, an opening, an internal opening, not necessarily a removal of the boundary, but a, an in, internal opening to allow that person to come in while still maintaining a boundary with them. So practicing openness counts for everything. <laughs> so in one way, I, what I hear you saying is that we don't respect each other's boundaries or we don't even recognize them. And so then when, the moment we cross them, whatever they are and for whatever reason they're there, then there's a reaction which we've called a resistance or like there's some kind of a reaction. And we don't even know our own boundaries. So we I don't... Re I didn't really say that, Richard. You got <laughs> I didn't say it. I what are, it's, it's, you don't have to cross someone's boundary to disagree with them. We, I, I, I could disagree with you without crossing your boundary or, or breaking my own down. I could just disagree with you, say, well, that's, we have a difference of opinion here. Now, when I say that, what could happen is I could close inside to protect me from what's coming back from you, which would be natural, or I can stay wide open. Now, it's not natural to stay wide open. That takes practice. That's what I'm saying. Is it kind of like, let's say I was trying to move my fingers independently and somehow my nervous patterns aren't, my nerve patterns aren't there and some of them go together and some of them go separate. And so That's then me. somehow your, your closing and your boundaries are somehow not differentiated enough so that in order to set the boundaries, you feel like you just have to squinch up totally. It's not it's not a conscious choice, I don't think. I don't think people consciously close. I think it's an unconscious thing. It's an unconscious automatic reaction to threat. When we when we challenge somebody or say something they might not agree with, I think that automatically, unconsciously, we close inside. And that creates a resistance in us and gives us another reference point to who we think we are, with this one that's contracted. And in learning to open that, in learning to not resist, in learning to not close inside, we start to live more like letting the world come through us and let it, instead of it constantly hitting us. And if you look at what that really means, that means there's less of us in the way because there's nothing to get hit. There's, not, there's, there's less of us as, a, as an identified mind. 
So we talk about, you know, people talk about waking up and anyone can have a Satori. You can have a Satori kicking a bit of sand on the beach or just looking at a leaf or meditation or sitting with a teacher. You can have an experience of your true nature, a Satori. But then we look at, well, what's, in the, what's possibly in the way? What obstacles might be in the way of that remaining? So there's a, an ongoing uh, knowing of self, an ongoing Satori. And then we look at, well, the obstacle, and there is only one obstacle. That's the I, the identified mind, the contraction that keeps attracting attention to itself. So in learning to be open, in learning not to resist life, this identified mind that attracts attention to itself starts to dissipate and there's much more space because this solid thing's not there anymore. And it seems to be easier for beingness to know itself. But if the mind's constantly contracting because it's in resistance to life, well, awareness tends to go to that. And we live pretty much wherever our awareness is at. And if our awareness is locked on a mind that is contracted in resistance to life, we live as that. And that's suffering. Does contracted mean uh, in deep in interpretation? It's not interpretation. It's just, it's like I closed my fist. There's no thought. It's just closed, you know. And then it's open. Now it's nicer to live like that than to live like that. Sometimes it seems like I've noticed that uh, contractions have uh, conjoined thought patterns or belief structures that go with them. Yeah, true. Usually, actually. And the belief structures uh, can be dismantled. I love Byron Katie's work, Challenging Beliefs. Pretty good stuff. Because without beliefs, we're not imprisoned. And with beliefs, we are. Every belief is a prison. In a way, it crossed my mind that every belief is a justification so I could just be how I've been, so I could be stuck in, in my selfness. And you like to think that you're more conscious than you are. Most people don't, don't know what their beliefs are. They don't know how they got there. They just took them on through osmosis from their family, their culture, their peers. They never even challenged them. To think that they actually consciously put those beliefs out and operate on them would be, that would be a stretch. Most people don't see what they're doing. You've got to have a look. You've got to examine your mind, see how the agendas work, see how the defense systems come into place, see what beliefs are involved in those defense systems. Otherwise, it's all unconscious for most people. It just happens. <laughs> Can you really dig that out or does that just come out when it comes out? You can start looking, you know, you start looking at your mind, you start examining your mind, how it works. Why, do, why is it so? Why do I believe that? Why do I not believe that? Why am I operating in this way? Is that belief system that's having me operate in this way, has it got any substance or is it just something that mum and dad gave me or my school gave me or my peers gave me or my church gave me? Is it real? And if it's not real, why am I operating like this? You know? But most people never examine their beliefs. They just believe what they believe. I mean, I was a Catholic. I was brought up a Catholic. I believed. I believed in Christianity. I believed that Jesus died on a cross to save me. I'd never questioned it because everyone around me believed it. Why should I question it? It had to be true. So you really have to be innovative as a young person to want to dig in any of that. Ah, you become a seeker, a seeker of wisdom and truth. <laughs> Socrates said, know thyself. Well, he was only talking about the mind and the body. But that's the beginning, to know your mind, to know your body, to know how it all works, to see why you do what you do. What is your agendas? Why do you answer in that manner? Why do you do that? What beliefs come into play? Because if we can't see what we're doing, how can it ever be changed? We can't change what we can't see. And if we're running in a whole pile of belief systems that make us unhappy and we can't even see them, well, 
we run true to our programming, we remain unhappy. So noticing is the first step, of course. Very much so. Well, knowing the first step is, is, is kind of like a wanting to have a look, a, a curiosity. What's this all about? Who am I? And of course, the who am I, from a Western point of view, usually is what's the mind all about? It's about psychology. And, and what's the body all about? It's about biology and psychology. So that's usually a beginning. What's this about? What's, why does my mind do this? Because a lot of us weren't brought up in the, with the idea that there was such a thing as enlightenment, that there was such a thing as something greater than our mind, except God up there who was separate from us somewhere. So we never really looked for that beauty, that sky that we are, that vast everything that we are. We never looked because we were told that God lived up there somewhere in the sky and was looking on us and judging us. It stopped us from seeing who we were, what was here, what's really here. The beauty, the beauty. So wanting to, to notice and then noticing, and then maybe another step would be to stop defending what we notice and just look at it in a very neutral, uncommitted way. Different approaches. I mean, for, for me, if someone if someone's coming to me and they want to know about truth, the first thing for me really is not to talk to them about their fences or obstacles. It's to see if there's a possibility they can find themselves, their true selves. Because when you get a taste of your true nature, then there's a motivation. Then there's a motivation to have a look at the obstacles. Then there's a motivation to actually find more of that truth because you've had a taste of it and it's beautiful. And I think that's what someone who's awake can offer. There's a potential in being with someone who's awake that you may see yourself, you may see your true nature. The information they give you might be rubbish, but the energy field they carry, you might dissolve in that and find yourself as truth. That's the gift of satsang. When that first happened to me, I, I, uh, there was such a transference that I didn't really realize it, it had anything to do with me. <laughs> and I just felt like, uh, this guy's great. <laughs> mm. You know, and I want to be around him. But somehow it yeah. took a long time before I, I really kind of got it that, hey, he's trying to tell me something about myself. Yeah, yeah. Like, who's looking? Who's looking out of those eyes? just actually took me many, many years to uh, realize that I was not, I was not seeing these people as models, but I was just seeing them as somehow leaders or, I don't know if that's clear. I, I see them as walking black holes. <laughs> and everything gets sucked into them. If you let go of your resistance, you'll get sucked in there and you'll find yourself as everything. Now, they might have some knowledge that goes with that, some wisdom that goes with that. Fair enough. They might be able to teach you how to be a man or a woman or they might teach you where your obstacles are. But really, someone who's awake is just a walking black hole. And if you get close enough, you might fall in and find yourself as truth. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're nobodies. They're nothing. And for me, it's like uh, with Osho Rajneesh in 1985, in sitting close to him and talking to him, I disappeared. As an eye, I just disappeared. And there was this terror arose because, gosh, I wasn't real. And it was really clear I wasn't real. And I was on a camera because I was interviewing him as a journalist. And it was the most bizarre thing because up to that point, I had never disappeared. I was identified with being a somebody and it blew my mind and he was just being himself 
He was being obstinate, actually, in a lot of ways. But he was just being himself. He was being. He was aware of himself as being. And in that awareness, there's a Buddha field or an energy field that dissolved my mind and had me experience something of my true nature. And because of that, I see him as my spiritual father because with him, I saw my true nature for the first time. I had seen him also. And uh, with me, well, I mean, I felt that many of my concepts and many of my horizons uh, were were broken, and or my horizons were lifted uh, in great ways. But I never felt that you know I felt he was a special person, which I guess he was. But I mean, uh, I just felt that everything that uh, I experienced was really him and not me. And uh, I, I, I transfer. You know, it was. I call it a transference. You know, I transferred everything to be his, his power. And uh, I fell into that. Yeah, that's just. Uh, well, it's just. You know, I, I, the word's a little bit rough, but that's just ignorance. Because yeah, if you had, a, if I you thought had a, it was great too. You know, so I was really <laughs> super ignorant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You just didn't see deep enough that it was you. That's all. You just yeah. didn't see deep enough. I didn't start to see that depth until I started talking just to uh, regular guys, more like me, that just maybe like you, uh, that uh, I could identify more with, and that didn't yeah. have all the trappings of uh, of, of specialness. Yeah, really. And, uh, I agree with that. Uh, the first, uh, what helped me a great deal with this was a, a teacher called Isaac Shapiro. Because uh, before I met Isaac, I'd been with Osho, and Osho sat up on his throne, and he had all his beautiful clothes on, and he was a remarkably well-dressed, well, interestingly dressed man. And he was so special to me. And then to meet Isaac, who was very, very ordinary, you know, he... He blew my mind when he when he got up in satsang to go and have a pee. <laughs> and he was just so human, but he had this presence. You know, he had this presence. I could feel him. It was the same presence as Osho. And I knew that, you know, enlightenment doesn't have a look. It doesn't look like someone. It doesn't look like someone sitting with their legs crossed in a lotus position. It doesn't look like someone peaceful. It looks like you. But what it feels like, that's different. What it feels like. Someone who's awake has a presence, and that presence is palpable. And in that presence, you can find yourself. But it doesn't look like anything. I remember watching Nisigadara uh, give, give uh, talks, throwing his arms around, and chewing betel nut, while he was had, didn't have very many teeth, so it's coming out, and I'm looking at this guy waving his arms around and shouting, and realizing that he was one of the greatest sages of the last century. But you look at him, if you have a judgment of what enlightenment should look like, you'd say, no, he's not enlightened. Why would he be throwing his arms around? He's got no teeth. He's spitting yeah. at you, <laughs> and he's yelling. <laughs> but the presence of the man knocked people out. It's the presence. It's the awareness aware of itself, beingness aware of itself. And that's the walking, that's, that's, the, that's the attraction for the seeker, to find that, and to, to dissolve in that and find themselves as truth. If they want. <laughs> <laughs> that's another thing that happened to me with Osho, you know. I was always expecting uh, a very manicured... Uh, with uh, th you know, thrilling protocols and uh, like I, I wouldn't have looked at uh, Nisargadatta or I wouldn't have even looked at Papaji probably, you know, whereas many people from Osho uh, went down to check out Papaji. But 
uh, probably I would have said, no, he's got to be in some kind of a regal, have a regal look. You know, I had a, a real preconception going. Yeah. So did I. In a way, Osho spoiled us in that way. Because he was really, he was really different, man. <laughs> hmm. He used to say, though, you know, that, that it was ordinary. And he used to say that he was ordinary. And he was telling the truth. It's just he didn't look that way. <laughs> and nobody treated him that way. No, he was treated like a god. I mean, just to get within a, to get within kind of like 50 feet of him was special back in the day. Well, you could because he did the drive-bys. Yeah. Just for a second, right? <laughs> yeah, for a second. <laughs> <laughs> that were fun days. They certainly were. Mm. I guess, you know, like most of the world, uh, I'll say it that way, but I mean, I could have just said for most of my life, I just probably thought it was ridiculous to uh, be open-hearted and just to let, let something in, let something new in or let another person in. Yeah, so did I, up until I was 33, and then I realized I was broke. I was financially successful, but I was broke because I didn't have enough heart. And if you haven't got heart, my understanding is, and it was back then, is you're bankrupt. Because it's the only thing that seems to have any value on this plane. Heart, love, that's the beauty, the true jewel of consciousness. You're a very lucky man to have realized that only at 33. <laughs> you might say you went a long time without it, but I'd tell you. It you broke my a, heart when I realized that. It broke my heart right open when I realized that I'd done all these things to be successful. You know, I, so many people had been let down. So many people had been treated with less than what they deserved so I could be successful in the world. And it broke my heart to see that I'd been involved with that long and I felt like for the 33 years of my life, I'd wasted 33 years in serving myself instead of serving the beauty Don't you have to do that to have a have such a, a strong conviction? Somehow you have to play have both to play both ends. You just have to see it. You just have to see it. I think you could see it by looking at the world, but you have to see it. And we we don't look. We win, and we think winning is good. I mean, I went to a school where winning was everything. You know, a private college and. Uh, it was all about winning. It didn't really matter how you won, just as long as you won, as long as you were successful. So I left school and I did what I was programmed to do, be successful, you know, at the cost of my heart, at the cost of other people. And when the realization came that that's what had happened, it was just devastating. I've heard you talk about homeschool, so then maybe... Uh... That's not a necessity that uh, uh, we learn in school only to win. That's one of the reasons I, my wife and I homeschooled our kids because uh, I didn't want them to get closed up at school. I didn't, I didn't want to get them programmed in a way that was going to keep them uh, imprisoned for life. And I wanted to be close to them. It's nice to be close to your kids. That's a beautiful strategy. Mm. What did you learn? I mean, did it work? Or, I mean, kids, yeah, are, my... kids are enculturated anyhow, right? They are, but because they had a different way, they didn't close up as much. You know, you put your, kid, your, your child in school and there's so much 
bullying going on. There's so much teasing going on that the little hearts build all these defense systems and they close up and they get a lot of uh, wounding around self-worth. And so my children, to a large degree, missed out on that and they're quite, they shine. They, they shine. And I'm really glad that we took the time and uh, homeschooled them. So they get immune to that, uh, the, uh, the, the thoughts of others. I mean, can they be immune already at eight years old or uh, 12 years old? Or, I no, mean, no. But they kind of know how to respect people. They know how to love. They know how to be open. They know how to talk in a way to adults. So adults are equals, not something you hide from. They, they're more wholesome. Mm. They're beautiful, man. Mm. So an experience like that could uh, could sway some people to get involved in education and a compassion for so many kids that are are uptight and totally innocent. Uh, that's a very compassionate insight. Yeah, well, we we had a a friend whose child was struggling at school, and so we homeschooled him as well for a little while, I think for a year and a half or something, because he was having a lot of trouble. And um, that was nice. Also gave my kids someone to compete with, as far as exams are concerned, a little bit of motivation. And that was nice. I got to say though, I didn't do most of the homeschooling. My wife did. She's the academic one. I'm, I'm, I'm not an academic. But my kids used to come to the meetings, to the satsang meetings, and boy, did they pick up a lot of useful knowledge. <laughs> they do very well in their in their little worlds. What ages did they did they come to those meetings? Uh, Genevieve was four, and Jared was. Two. Wow. And I used to sit sit on my lap and fall asleep while I was doing satsang. Wow. Mm -hmm. They like the energy field. They used to just they used to just rest in it and sleep in it. Right away, my active mind wants to say that the whole world needs to be homeschooled, right? Starting now. <laughs> I'd agree with you. I'd agree with you. I, 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 At any I age. That, I think that schools can be very damaging to kids because kids don't have much morality, if any, or consciousness, and they can be very cruel to each other. It's like up until they, they get consciousness, they're like sociopaths, you know? They have no empathy. So, you know, you've raised this little baby and it gets to four or five years old and you have to put it in preschool or something and you're taking it along and putting it in a class with another 20 or 30 sociopaths. <laughs> Who, yeah, and you wonder why your kids get weird. <laughs> so we did that. We actually put our kids in school and we pulled them out again when we realized they were getting damaged. Rajneesh had so many ways to get inside and uh, 
I guess he really didn't have any any limits or any uh, any off limits. Let's say he just uh, tried everything or whatever. Whatever. Yeah. Whatever the human can innovate. Innovate, yeah. So, sort of a lot of stuff disappears when you start finding yourself as beingness or truth. Uh, a lot of our cultural understandings, a lot of our morality disappears, if not all of it. Anything that's kind of mind-made, out of touch with nature, tends to get challenged and surrendered. And so you find yourself trying all sorts of different things. And uh, heart, heart's awake and the heart kind of, I, I think there's a word, ahimsa, the heart just won't do any harm. So as it comes through the mind, there's this not wanting to do any harm. This is so it's not a morality, it's not an idea, it's not a belief system, it's actually more of a feeling that you just don't want to do any harm, you just want to help people if you can. So maybe that could be personal that, uh, you know, I don't want to do any harm, but maybe it could also be more collective in that uh, I would like to nurture systems that don't blindly create harm. For me, it's always been a, an individual thing rather than a big worldly thing. It's like, what, are, what am I responsible for here? And, you know, the people that I affect are the ones who are close to me, not the ones I can't see, not the world, but the ones who live around me and near me and say hello to me. They're the ones that I can love and love <laughs> and whatever comes with that you know whatever comes with that I totally get that, that uh, the world is just a concept mm. and that uh, the world is just us. Well, if it's not in front of me, it's not real. If it's not in front of me, then I have to use my imagination to bring it here. And that's not real. Imagination is not real. It's a dream. And I prefer reality. I, I like what's here. So even though you're a lot, a lot of miles away from where I am, I can see your image. So I'm with you. I hear your voice. So I'm with you because you're in front of me. But if you're not in front of me, you're not real. Not really. You're just a dream. So much of our life is uh, my life, let's just say. Had, has been manipulating what's in front of me. Sure. I'm living in the right community, living in the right country, you know, maybe a, a, maybe a place with a gate and, uh, and just homes that have a certain tax value so only people like me can afford them. And uh, so then it's a little artificial sometimes what's in front of me. No, it's real. Whatever's in front of you is real. You know, well, it's realer than what you're imagining, isn't it? <laughs> well, artificial means it's manipulated. You know, I oh, I set yeah, it up but, that way. I set it up that way. Sure, but wherever you are, there you are. And right next to me, I've got a beautiful, happy plant. That's real right now. But then I look back to you; it's no longer real. I can't see it now. <laughs> now I can imagine it as there, but that's not real. 
and I tend to not want to live in the imagination. So it's not very interesting, it means. No, it's not that it's not interesting. It's just that I prefer reality. Not just beingness and heart, which is reality, but what's in front of me. Not what I think is in front of me, but what's in front of me. What I think's in front of me is a dream. What's in front of me is real. So we can look at a sunset and say, and we can look at it and we can be with it. The moment we say, isn't that beautiful, we're already a little bit off because we've gone to the mind. We've gone to dream. You get these thrill seekers, you know, these guys that jump off cliffs or hunt sharks. They come into the moment, so, race motorcycles. They come into the moment so firmly, so so here, so present, and it is such an attraction to that. That moment, the dream's gone. You're actually here now. And for a lot of my life, that's actually how I found the moment, through being involved in dangerous sports. It was rugby or martial arts or shark hunting or racing motorcycles. There was this seeking of this moment through through danger. And it wasn't until I met Rajneesh that I realized that you could find this moment through meditation. You could actually drop all your dream and just be here. Now, that's not enlightenment, that's, but that's really nice, just to be here, rather than be here dreaming. So could that be a taste, what they call in the zone? Which is no, that's, which is either no danger or it's, you know, I mean, you you spoke of it as a dangerous sports, but it also could just be in performance sports. It may be not da be. dangerous to play basketball, but you want to get a lot of hoops. You just lost your ear. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You can be very in the moment and playing basketball. I would agree with that. A bit harder to be in the moment with chess. So I, I never knew why I was so attracted to those things until I, I learned how to meditate and I could sit in no mind without having to be in danger. And I realized this is what I was looking for. I was looking for this space of reality, not space of beingness because really that's just no mind. But this space of reality is so nice to be here without the noisy one. So that's what we're calling a taste. Well, you're calling it a taste and I'm calling it no mind. <laughs> I'm calling it being so present you're not even thinking. Like if you're on a motorcycle and you're doing 250 kilometers an hour, you're not thinking because if you are, you're going to die. You've got to just be there. Same same with fast cars. You know, you, you're up there in the, around the 200s, 300s. You're, you you got to be there. Otherwise, you die. And if you're hunting, I used to be a hunter for many years. I used to hunt uh, underwater. And you've got to be there. The hunting mode is a, is a very, you've got to be there mode because you could be being hunted. Where I used to dive, there was a, definitely a possibility of that. <laughs> and that, that kind of turned you on a little bit more, you know, because you're really present, really present. You probably always were hunted down there, right? Yeah. Maybe not stalked at that moment, but you were definitely prey, right? Yep, you were prey because there's some big fish out there. <laughs> we get the great whites off the coast here. and I've seen a few of them underwater, and they're scary. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I, hear, I hear mountain climbers get it too. You know, these guys that go on the cliffs and that, they get they get into this space of just being so present, it's so exhilarating. But I've never been really into mountain climbing, so I haven't experienced it that way. I think when we were little kids, you know, one, years old, one year old, two years old, we were very present until we started being able to conceive and project forward and remember back. We were just very present, and it's such a, we call it innocence, but it's really just being really present. 
really present to what's happening rather than present to what we're saying is happening in our heads. And uh, we can gain that again as adults. It's like uh, regaining reality from the dream that we've found ourselves in. And I'm not talking enlightenment here. I'm simply talking about being present to reality. So that's a space where, where somehow we can discover ourselves. It's the best place because the mind is really open and relaxed in that space. So you come into satsang and you sit with someone who's awake and your mind starts to relax and you start to become present to them if you're lucky. <laughs> I say if you're lucky because quite often when your mind relaxes, anything you've been sitting on comes out. So <laughs> there's another side there. But in that relaxation, in that restful mind, it's easier for beingness to find itself. It's easier for awareness to turn on itself. I would have almost thought that that's the only way it can do it, but... I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. Anything I'm not sure of, I don't know. It's best, you know. One of my teachers, uh, when I first started teaching, I said, have you got any advice for me? And he said, whatever you do, only talk about your direct experience in the moment and you'll be safe. <laughs> the moment you step out of your own direct experience, you're in trouble. It's best to go, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's so easy for me to make a broad statement and just say, well, hot. Hang that up a little bit and see how that feels. Mm. There's a danger in that because it becomes a habit and you you start thinking you do know when you don't. And the moment we think we know, we're actually closed. We've stopped, we've stopped the flow into us. But if we can stay open, and the Buddhists call this the beginner's mind, to be a beginner every moment, to not know, and that way the universe can pour itself into you. You remain the eternal student because you're not closed. The moment you say you, you know, you're closed. You don't, that's it, you know. It's closed. <laughs> so a part of the openness game is not knowing. And really who we are is, is, is not knowing, not knowing, the unknown. It's not knowing, every moment not knowing. Sometimes paying attention to the outside can also bring a realization of we really don't know what's going on. And uh, but mostly we always point toward looking on the inside. I'm not. I'm not following you, Richard. Sorry. What are you? What are you saying? <laughs> I mean, you could just look around, eh, even at current events or just how society works and just realize that you don't really know what's going on. Well, we're not there. It's not firsthand and working in the media for as long as I did, I know that they fabricate the stories that we see on television. They're not true. They're made up with a, a certain bend bent in them so something will be believed that may not necessarily be so. We don't get accurate reporting, that's what I'm saying. You want to find out what's happening, you've got to go there. <laughs> but it's a bit dangerous in Afghanistan, you know. Right. <laughs> it's not something you, that I would volunteer for. <laughs> it's a dangerous sport. You probably would be on the edge and in the zone. Maybe, yeah, I was a, maybe that's what drives I, the reporters. Could be. I had a. I was a conscientious objector, so I didn't. When I was at school, the Vietnam War was on, mm -hmm. and um, I didn't agree with that war. So I uh, I marched against it in the moratoriums, and I was a, a conscientious conscientious objector because I didn't believe that our country should be there uh, killing those people. So you probably wouldn't find me volunteering to go to Afghanistan. 
because I haven't particularly changed my point of view. <laughs> well, you'd have a camera instead of a rifle. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I like it here. Thanks. <laughs> right on. <laughs> yeah. I like America. I've been to America a few times now. America's nice. Americans like Australians for some reason. They like the accent, I think. And I was made to I, I was made to feel very welcome when I was in America. By strangers. Just they could hear the accent and somehow no, they locked sure. onto it. For sure you 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 caught on to that, right. Mm. I don't know. I, I found in myself uh, many, many, many years of uh, uh, I was, it was very easy to cut out the world's pain or cut out what's, what uh, you know, the world's injustice, which is just another kind of pain. And um, I don't, maybe I just don't trust that the way I used to. Trust that it's I can be clean of it. Clean. It's just well, what is. Yeah. It's just what is. Life is what it is. You know, people suffer. People die. People get hurt. It's how it is. This is, this is. this is the plane we live in. This is how it is. It's neither good nor bad. It's just what is. You know? Well, I mean, I can also get, uh, if I'm involved with some, some part of suffering, maybe I can ease it. Or is that just too noble? I don't think there's anything wrong in easing pain, you know. You know, if, if you love people, that you nourish them so much. You just love them. Pain relief. It's called love. <laughs> right, I'm just discovering that much later than maybe you have and it's it seems now. like a big deal you know <laughs> it's only now it's only now the past doesn't exist the person who didn't love before doesn't exist there's only now the person who loved before doesn't exist. There's only now. Just now. It does seem rather complete. <laughs> Indeed. You know, contentment for no reason is pretty cool. You know, there's completion in itself. Those are very powerful words, just contentment for no reason. Yeah. And we deny ourselves of that for lifetimes, really, for decades anyhow. Only because we're ignorant, only because we don't know. If we really knew, we wouldn't deny ourselves that contentment. If people truly knew what their true nature was about, they would do everything for it. They would do everything to find it, if they knew. But most people don't know. They're not thirsty because they don't know. 
that's why having a taste of the beauty of our true nature is so important. So this this thirst for it can arise. And in that thirst, we do whatever it takes to get out of the way and to turn awareness back to itself, whatever we can do. And the best, really, we can do is get out of the way and allow it to live. It feels to say that we don't know because it just never crossed our mind. I mean, we well, never had an well, inc inkling it? of it. Yeah, why would it? Why would it? We're, we were born in Christian countries. Why would it be? Why would it cross our minds? Unless we study Eastern Eastern religions. Unless we had a direct experience too. There's another chance. I mean, I had an experience of being this when I was about 12, but I had no idea what it was. I thought I was going insane. I lost my identity for a little while, a few hours. I was just nothing for a little while, just absence. And, uh, you know, I thought I was going nuts. I didn't want to tell anyone what was happening because I didn't want to be made fun of because it didn't fit into my Christian understanding of the world. Did, did that ever come up in your homeschooling uh, with your children? What was that? Well, I mean, uh, they know. They would know if it happened to them. They would know what it means or what it's all about. Osho used to say, the fish in the ocean are not thirsty. When you're sitting in a Buddha field all the time, you don't know that you, you don't know. You're still ignorant. You don't recognize that it's you. So even though they were sitting in the Buddha field, they didn't know. It's like you, it's almost like you have to be completely separate from it and then find it and then value it from the mind's perspective and give it your everything from the mind's perspective. You value it. Your mind becomes a servant of that, not a servant of itself any longer because you value it more than anything. It is so beautiful. And in that valuing and in that service, you'd start disappearing. You just dissolve. Because it's real. You're not. Nothing about you is real. You're just a bunch of thoughts, a bunch of reference points based on the past projected to the future. So are you saying you can't know that until you get those reference points, until you get lost, until the prodigal son leaves the, leaves the Buddha field and, uh, and then has a chance to say, hey, what, what, what have I left? What's the difference here? What's the contrast? I can say I think so, but I can also say at the same time I don't know because maybe some people wake up at birth. I don't know. I mean, there's some woman, there's a woman called Amma, I think, the mother, and apparently she was awake at birth. Now, I've never met Arma, but maybe, I don't know. Maybe that's what happened. I don't know. It's not been the experience here, I can assure you. And I have never witnessed anyone or heard of anyone in my sphere that that's happened to. But, you know, maybe that's happened. I don't know. I think, uh, I think people, I think the one thing that really works well for people to get motivated to truth is suffering. If you suffer enough, you get sick of it, you start looking for a way out. <laughs> and Buddha said there was two arrows, of tr uh, f two arrows, two thirsts for truth. One was, I want the bliss, I want the love, I want the expanded mind, I don't want the suffering anymore. That'll take you about a third of the way. And then if you fall in love with truth, that'll take you the rest of the way. Because in that love affair, you'll die. But not if you're just trying to get away from pain. In the love affair, you lay down your life for it, and you won't mind suffering. Maybe I haven't heard of that before, because I I always kind of doubted the uh, what seems like in so many cases the origins of the spirituality being the suffering. Because I thought, okay, well, suffering is a Who's suffering? It's got to be me suffering, because your suffering doesn't doesn't uh, cause me to seek. And so then well, it, it's so individual, and so the foundation of that kind of 
of that part of spirituality seems to be a separateness. And uh, but yeah. yet you're saying at the end you you that takes you one third of the way. That was very maybe one third. Interesting to, to say that, and then falling in love with the truth takes you the rest it's of the, the way. Next, the there, next step. There is another motivator that I discovered. It's the motivator of curiosity. Some people are natural explorers. They're curious, you know, and they have a look and the curiosity takes them a third of the way. But curiosity won't take you much further either because at a certain point you start to find that you actually have to surrender a lot. And if you don't have that love affair, you won't surrender you'll still hang on to sovereignty because what you're surrendering is sovereignty. The ego is sovereignty. Say more about that. What's sovereignty? I haven't heard it spoken that way. The I am somebody is personal sovereignty. I am the somebody that wants this. I am the sovereign. I am the one that wants to make it happen this way. This is my sovereignty. I'm in charge here. In the love affair with truth, you hand that sovereignty over to truth and you let the river take you. And wherever the river takes you, you say yes. Your sovereignty is now gone. Now the river takes you. And it might throw you against the shore, it might throw you on rocks, but it's okay. That's yes too. It might take you to heaven, have you in a palace, that's yes to. Same yes. A warm welcoming of whatever appears. I haven't seen too many rocks in my life. You know, I thought about rocks for a while, but uh, they never really occurred. And, uh, <laughs> Maybe you didn't need any rocks. God definitely showed me a few rocks. <laughs> it was cool. Yep. <laughs> it was like white, white water rafting. Here's another one. <laughs> Without a raft. <laughs> yeah, whatever we hang on to is a rock. That's like where we get nailed to the ground, so we can't fly. Whatever we hang on to, it's how we get nailed to the ground. We can't fly. You've got to let go to fly. So what we're hanging on to are our concepts. We hang on to our relationships. We hang on to our money. We hang on to our power. We hang on to our ideals, our beliefs. We hang on to lots of things. But they're all you know, places where we're nailed to the ground. We hang on to our life. We hang on to our sanity. We just won't let go of control. And openness really is about letting go of control and letting the river take you. So that person, personal sovereignty that makes up the I starts to dissipate. As Jesus said, thy will be done, not my will. Seems like surrender is kind of an empty word when, and when what's here is something I'm enjoying, and so then, I'm, of course, I'm surrendering to it, and uh, without. What do you reckon surrendering is, though, Rich? What's surrender really? When what is that? See, for me, surrender is not doing anything. You know, you talked, you started tonight a little bit about not doing, about being able to be still, not running. Surrender is a non-doing. And that's why it's so hard for the ego to get, for the mind to get, because the mind is designed for doing. 
You know, so people say, well, how do I do surrender? Well, you don't. <laughs> 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 it's learning not to do. Which is really difficult to learn. True. I love to do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was a, when I was a businessman. I was a doaholic. You know, it's one of the ways I escaped my my pain. I didn't realize it at the time. But if you keep doing, you you were successful. You make money. It looks good. You think you're doing the right thing. But it was one of the ways that I avoided what was inside of myself. And yet there's still activity. Not much. <laughs> A more pure state of non doing then. That's more clear, because I was conceiving uh, surrender as surrendering to what's coming down the road, and uh, I said, well, if I like what's coming down the road, which are my projects, uh, then that doesn't seem like a very heavy-duty surrender. But uh, surrender to non-doing and just stop your pro my projects. People identify with what they're doing. They identify themselves as the one that's going to do that. And if you take away someone's projects, they quite often go into an identity crisis. Um, I mean, when I was a businessman, I had a few partners doing different things. And one of them had a nervous breakdown, ended up in a, a, a hospital because he'd failed in business and that was his identity and now he didn't know who he was because his future had been taken off him, his projection. So we take our projects away, and who are we? And can we be content with being nothing? Or are we driven to be something that has a future? I'm driven. <laughs> so was I, man. I was really driven. You know, it was, it was, it was difficult to give everything away and just allow myself to be a nothing, a nobody. Yeah, but. So you were curious or something, or I don't know. Or is that another drive to find out? I don't know. So if the whole thing is about, the, in a way, I, I don't like using the word much, but it's like a death, a death of the, the I, the death of the one that wants to have a future. A letting go of things. So can you be content with just being a nobody, a nothing, going nowhere? Because that's who we really are. It seems like there's high periods and low periods, and that too will pass, and then somehow there's more energy and more projects and more dreams come in and I don't know if they're really constructed as a, an answer to that s slower period or if it's just some kind of cycle that that uh, human energy goes through. But what about right now with me? You know, like right now, here, you know, there's no future. There's just you and me talking. We can imagine a future, but we don't have to. We can just be here. And we can be here all the time because here is real. We don't have to live in our dream. We can start surrendering it and be more present. <laughs> <laughs>